So much of our lives is mediatized. Here we are, in the heart of a high-tech totalitarian era of corporate state surveillance and digital demagoguery, floundering amidst the daily tsunami of trending tweets, notifications, and breaking news. We update, upgrade, upload, download, delete, tweet, copy, paste, like, and love one another as information multiplies beyond our capacity to synthesize it as ideals and ends flooding our mediatized cognitive circuits during our sleeping as much as our waking hours. Here, at the dawn of the third millennium, our lives are full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Info wars are indeed real. Armies of ideologues hurl soundbite bombs back and forth in an unending cycle of rhetorical violence enacted on the battleground of human hope and despair. Of course, this is nothing new. It is as old as ideas themselves, the drivers of transformation from one era to the next, the pivots of power, and refuge for the defeated. And so it is that philosophy, the great steward, explorer, critic, formulator, incubator, and arbiter of ideas, exists in this world. While of course not the sole source of ideas, philosophy has always been rather more at home in their ethereal realm than has perhaps any other discipline. And as the quintessential discipline of ideas, it should come as no surprise that philosophy is not always above the fray of ideological warfare. Like media pundits or politicians, philosophers too are known to shout at one another, to fervently denounce opposing views, to protest against and insult the opposition, and to campaign for specific agendas. Indeed, philosophers found schools and articulate research programs to distinguish themselves from other philosophical schools. They start journals, form cliques of dense jargon around their favorite philosophical cult figures, and often politicize or even weaponize ideas to be deployed on social battlegrounds. So what, then, for all its erudition, does philosophy have to offer the world if not merely its own varieties of discursively elevated, institutionally fortified, peer-reviewed tribal warfare? At the very least, one could come to philosophy's defense by pointing out that it promises some of the most inspired contemplative excursions into questions of lasting concern, like how should we live, or what gives our lives meaning. But what about when it comes time for the philosopher, who by reputation is so well practiced in the suspension of judgment, to finally render a judgment and put something at stake in their philosophizing by venturing to answer these pressing questions? What makes a philosophical answer any better than an ideological one? Or is it any better? How do they differ from one another? Or are they actually not so different at all? Is philosophy, ever the world's vigilant guardian of open-minded dialogue and critical self-reflection, inevitably bound to become, at some time or another, in one way or another, just more zeal for another ism? Whether Platonism or Aristotelianism, idealism or materialism, existentialism, rationalism, empiricism, Confucianism, liberalism, anarchism, Marxism, Stalinism or Maoism, Hitlerism or Trumpism. This is Philosophy for the People, I'm your host, Nathan Wiley, here with producer Nick Cook. Hello. Today it is our unspeakable pleasure to welcome into the studio another one of my colleagues here at Marquette University, Bentley Kennedy Stone. Bentley is a second year PhD student who is interested in, among other things, ideological warfare and the function of propaganda in the battle of ideas. Bentley, my friend, thank you for joining us for today's discussion on philosophy and ideology. Thank you for having me on, Nathan. All right. So, Bentley, uh, as our point of entry into this perhaps rather fraught and complicated issue of the relationship between philosophy and ideology, which, by the way, we make no pretensions to be able to resolve today, we have a provocative paper that you've written. The title of the paper is Make Mine Freedom, a Propaganda Analysis. And one of the core premises of your argument through which we make our entry into today's discussion, is your definition of propaganda. Broadly defined, you write that propaganda is communication that exerts sociopolitical power intended to motivate behavior. 
Yes. Um, broadly defined, yes. Now, so understood, one of the upshots of this definition of propaganda you suggest in the paper is that it's a mistake to think of propaganda as merely an especially malicious subset of communication, since by your definition, all communication, as symbolic mediation, is propaganda. Because all communication in your analysis is definable as the exertion of socio-political power intended to motivate behavior, it's inherently propagandistic. Consequently, there can be no such thing as a conflict between ideas that isn't propagandistic on all sides. Even art, indeed all art you suggest, quoting George Orwell agreeably, is propaganda. Could you begin to walk us through the arguments of your paper and touch on this definition of propaganda that you've put forward? Absolutely. Uh, so the paper is an analysis of a cartoon from 1948 that was called Make Mine Freedom. Um, this cartoon was produced by the conservative Christian institution, Harding College, and it was paid for in, um, in a roundabout way by the U.S. government in a deal that involved funds being transferred through this thing called the Sloan Foundation, um, and the Sloan Foundation was owned by General Motors. Uh, so it was a sort of complex deal involving government programs, um, devoting funds toward the creation of propaganda, moving through uh, corporations. So the year 1948, when this cartoon was made, was, uh, of course, right in the middle of the Red Scare. Um, and it was also a time when labor unions had a great deal of power and influence. So the function of this cartoon at this time, the reason why the government and General Motors and Harding College created this cartoon is to propagate a pro-capitalist and anti-labor message, at least as I argue. Um, the cartoon attempts to connect an American understanding of freedom to a capitalist understanding of free enterprise. So alongside this association that the cartoon attempts to establish, it also offers a sharp criticism of any and all other political systems, most notably of communism and fascism, which would have been at the forefront of American minds at the time. And it lumps these ideologies and others together into um, a group that it names isms, right? So as in communism, fascism, socialism, etc. In the cartoon, these isms are represented as like this wonder drug that is being peddled by the very sinister and sneaky traveling salesman uh, whose name is Dr. Utopia. And uh, he sells this ism formula, which ends up just being nothing more than snake oil. The um, explicit argument in the cartoon is that while capitalism may not be perfect, it is at least grounded in reality and does not make false promises like Dr. Utopia's ism does. So in short, it's a propaganda cartoon, plain and simple. The cartoon, which we'll post in a link in the, in the description if you're listening on YouTube, it's about 10 or 11 minutes long, and you note in your analysis that it avoids ever referring to capitalism by name because, of course, it would then implicate itself as just another ism. That's right. Um, not once in the cartoon is the word capitalism ever used. Uh, it instead simply refers to it as our capitalistic system. So in the film's logic... Capitalism is, of course, not an ism itself, because for the film, at least, capitalism is implied in American style freedom and is baked in to American society. And, of course, at least for the film, America is the most natural kind of society that there can be. America is the default, whereas these isms are. Um, foreignly inspired divergences from the natural 
order of things. You've named several political ideologies, communism, fascism, capitalism. But in the cartoon, one of these disavows its status as an ideology, as you've pointed out, instead setting itself up as the natural and therefore good and true way of life. How can we connect up this notion of propaganda with that of ideology? Uh -huh, yes, good question. So um, if we're looking for ideology, then one general rule of thumb is that wherever we find a conception of what is natural or of what is good or what, uh, of what is true, then that's a pretty good sign that we have found ideology at play. And wherever we find communication that then propagates ideological thought, well, we have found propaganda. Um, propaganda, as I understand it, is quite simply a form of communication which propagates the contents of its message across multiple iterations of individual speech acts. So according to this understanding, propaganda is inherently viral insofar as it tends to spread itself and reproduce itself. So I could put this very simply by saying that propaganda is a message that propagates itself. Um, let me give some historical context on the word propaganda. So. Um, Originally, it didn't carry the negative connotations that it has today, um, namely the connotations of like deception or of manipulation. It actually originally comes from the medieval Catholic Church. And at its inception, it was an entirely good thing, or at least was understand, uh, understood as such, because it was just that which propagated the faith. This um, understanding of the term began to change with the emergence of mass media technologies, uh, such as the newspaper or the radio. But um, it wasn't really until the Second World War that the word propaganda took on the entirely negative meaning that it has today, um, which makes sense. I mean, when the Third Reich establishes the Ministry of Propaganda, and we see how terrible that was, then the word propaganda itself starts to assume some entirely sinister undertones. Um, but at least as I argue, these undertones are not essential to the process of, of discursive propagation. In other words, they're not essential to propaganda itself. And those sinister undertones are precisely what you would like to suspend from your definition of propaganda. So that in terms of your definition, namely, again, communication as the exertion of sociopolitical power intended to motivate behavior, your analysis of the cartoon in the paper understands the behavior the cartoon intends to motivate as, at least in part, getting boots on the ground, getting people to be willing to fight and die for that which the ideology defines as normal and good and true. Yes, uh, ideology gets boots on the ground, um, it gets seats in the pews, uh, and it gets protesters in the street. Um, it does all of this by positing ideologically motivated concepts. So these sorts of concepts would be, for example, concepts about normality, about goodness, or about truth. Um, and the reason why it's important to define propaganda so broadly and to suspend its negative connotations is because propaganda is produced, spoken, and distributed by sincere and well-meaning people, even when those people are making what we would consider to be true statements. So um, as an example, take a documentary on climate change. That documentary may make nothing but entirely true statements about climate science, but insofar as it exerts socio-political power and intends to motivate behavior, we would nevertheless consider it to be propaganda. So I bring this example up in order to establish that propaganda is not always deceptive, 
is not always malicious or is not always manipulative. Um, it's simply the way that we package statements. And that packaging always implies this or that certain interpretation of reality. And any interpretation of reality, in turn, implies certain conceptions of normality, of goodness, or of truth. So we call these conceptions ideology. Um, ideology for me is absolutely abundant, inescapable, in the same way that our physical bodies are inescapable. We live within a certain frame of reference, both physically speaking and ideologically speaking. And that frame of reference characterizes our perceptions and our interpretations of reality. I see your point. Um, so it's a mistake to think of ideology as something simply superimposed from the outside. Instead, if I'm understanding correctly, you're suggesting that ideology provides an embodied point of reference for how we live and move and have our being, including how we comport our bodies, our posture, our gestures, our likes and aversions. All of these are ideologically conditioned. Now, in terms then of how those forms of life reproduce themselves, this is where the notion of propaganda comes in. So to return to the cartoon you analyze in your paper, how does this cartoon illustrate some of the characteristics of propaganda as you understand them? So this cartoon, um, which is again called Make Mine Freedom, is, as the title suggests, all about freedom. And that concept of freedom is necessarily ideological because the word freedom can mean many diverse and contradictory things. So as an example, if we consider that freedom extends to the freedom to terminate one's pregnancy, then this particular conception of freedom necessarily excludes the possibility of extending itself to include a fetus's freedom from termination. So this is all to show that there is never such a thing as total freedom for all. If a conception of freedom is not to be self-contradictory, it can only extend into some realms of human experience at the exclusion of others. And where these borders are drawn is reflective of the ideology inherent in this or that particular conception. Um, so getting back to the cartoon, um, we find these borders are immediately drawn on the outside. Uh, the cartoon opens with the phrase, quoting it, America is many things to many people, end quote. It then goes on to say specifically what it is that America means to these particular groups of people whom it names. And of course, immediately with any grouping of people, we can find borderlines being drawn. So the cartoon explicitly draws borders between children whom it names, grandparents, mothers, and fathers, all of whom it names. And um, it attributes to each a particular understanding of what America is. So for children, according to the film, America is malt shops, America is jukeboxes, and puppy love. Um, for grandparents, it's rocking chairs, front porches, and evening breezes. Uh, to mothers, it's church on Sunday morning with the family. And to fathers, it's just golf. Um, so I watch this and I ask, uh, what the hell is any of this supposed to mean? Right? How does America mean golf to fathers, rocking chairs for grandparents, and jukeboxes to teenagers? Uh, don't all other countries have all of those things? Are children the only ones who listen to jukeboxes? If you take the cartoon literally, what it claims here is completely incoherent. So, of course, if you want to make sense of the cartoon, you can't take it literally here. Um, as I argue, what it's actually getting at is that each of these different activities 
hold a special place in the overall fabric of American subjectivity. So of course, other people from other countries have, you know, um, malt shops and porches and churches, but Americans engage with these things within a distinctly American context. So in this way, these activities take on a symbolic form. And so by placing these symbols in the mind of its audience, the cartoon establishes the first symbolic connection. It connects the emotions that we associate with, um, for example, young love or with family or with religion. It connects these to American society and to the American nation state. So if America is these things, then America is both constitutive of and constituted by these things. And implicit here is that without America, there is no church on Sunday. And without church on Sunday, there is no America. So the cartoon throws out what I would call identifiers in the form of ideologically charged symbols, the malt shop, the front porch, the church, and so on. And by throwing out these identifiers, the audience is effectively interpolated into the narrative, in this case of the cartoon, that is about to ensue. Yes, that's exactly what happens. French philosopher Louis Althusser talks about this technique of interpolation in relation to ideology. And we're all familiar with it if not always aware of when and how it's operative. Anytime you go to the movies or turn on Netflix, for example, for the medium to capture and maintain a hold on your attention, which is precisely what it's designed to do, it has to effectively interpolate you into the story, which it will typically do by putting you in the subject position of the protagonist, Tom Cruise or whoever it might be. So you identify with the protagonist and are interpolated into the narrative. And so when you disengage your critical intelligence to unwind or escape with two hours of entertainment at the end of a long day, which we all do, uh, any number of values or ideological biases are being reinforced as that character's experiences and affects are reproduced in you, the spectator. Yeah, uh, that's a good example. A uh, movie aims to deliver a certain experience via um, some or another set of coherent lights and sounds. Uh, the coherency of those lights and sounds is necessarily a symbolic one. So the lights and the sounds take the status of symbols. They mean more than what they are on their face. Um, about symbols, the precise meaning of a symbol is um, not something that you can ever fully articulate. You can't explain in, um, in logical, uh, in rational, or in fully explicated terms why you should cry when um, Old Yeller dies, right? Is, um, is crying the rational thing to do when you watch a movie? Um, I Probably not. So the way that we engage with media is not entirely rational. Um, and I want to be clear here that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, we might call this sort of engagement um, a sub-rational engagement. Um, and that's the sort of engagement that we partake in when we engage with symbols. And so this sub-rational engagement is, um, in my opinion, where all of life's myriad meanings can be found. So this sort of meaningful engagement then is possible only through engagement with symbols, which is possible only by virtue of our ideological embeddedness. And um, the nature of that embeddedness is never fully rationally explicable. So for this reason, in the paper, I describe these um, inexplicable relationships as epistemological black holes. And by that, I mean that these relations to reality are too deeply embedded to ever 
fully extract through rational analysis or to ever fully explicate. Hence, they remain subrational. They may not be fully explicable, but that isn't to say that symbols can't be wielded. And when they're wielded effectively in the movie or the novel, the New York Times article, the NPR podcast, the Amazon special, or any medium, what happens is emotions are stimulated in the subject. So the crying when old Yeller dies, or the solemn moral resolve to vote blue no matter who, or the association of the flag with freedom, these cognitive and affective responses are propagated among all of us who are embedded in these media milieus. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, symbols are constantly being wielded to propagate certain messages over others. Um, but we must keep in mind that symbols are always flexible. And being flexible, they are subject to um, distortion or simply to contortion. So as an example, when I try to communicate an idea or an experience to you, I package it around symbols. Um, the very words that I'm saying right now, symbols. And I can only at best, expect that there will always be a certain degree of infidelity in the transfer of those symbols. Um, unless you're telepathic, you'll never know exactly what I mean when I say what I say. Uh, there's always a degree of guesswork. So then, if you attempted to recount my experience to some third party, then this, uh, this distortion compounds it's like a game of telephone. Um, so we can say that propagation, um, that is to say the process by which I say something, you receive it, and then you pass it further down the chain, um, propagation incurs a certain degree of, of mutation across subsequent generations. Um, on the micro scale, you and me talking to each other casually, um, on the micro scale, these discursive mutations may appear random, but on a macro scale, we find, just as with biological evolution, that ideological discourse adapts to changes in its discursive environment so as to best propagate itself. The principle here is simple. An ideology which successfully propagates itself continues to persist and one which fails to propagate itself goes extinct. So in theory, at least, we can trace the history of these discursive adaptations in order to reveal the history of ideological functioning and formulation. Um, when we see human effort directing itself toward the manipulation of ideological evolution, um, when we see attempts to artificially select for certain ideological attitudes, well, then we can say that a symbol is being wielded with the aim of ideological propagation. And hence, we call this propaganda. So we can see now, I hope, that deception or sinister intent is not at all necessary for communication to be considered propaganda, though, of course, of course, that intent is often present, especially now. You write that the function of propaganda is to reconstruct the boundaries of these concepts or symbols, extending or contracting them to funnel its audiences down an intended path. So the first step, which we've covered, is that propaganda, at least as found in a piece like Make Mind Freedom, introduces symbols or concepts, here the concept of freedom, with all the appropriate accompanying symbols. In the second step, those symbols and concepts are stabilized within a certain range of meanings. And here again, ideology is crucial. You write that ideology can be understood as a network of axiomatic concepts. Now, understood in this way, ideology provides that stabilization of meanings. But at the same time, as you noted, symbols need to be flexible or adaptable if they're going to survive. So the function of propaganda then becomes 
you write, and here we have the second step, to reconstruct the boundaries of these concepts or symbols, extending or contracting them to funnel its audience down an intended path. Yes. Uh, so if the first step is the introduction of the symbol and its associated um, emotive attachments, then the second step, um, at least as it occurs in the cartoon specifically, is to attach that symbol, namely freedom in the cartoon, to the concept of free enterprise. And this is the pro-capitalist and anti-labor message. The cartoon is very subtle in the way that it does this attachment. Um, it simply replaces the terms. So as if it is still referring to freedom, it simply says the words free enterprise. Free enterprise equals freedom. Yes, when, of course, as we know, this equation is not at all uh, essential to either concept. However, it is essential to the ideology of capitalism. Right, or in the cartoon's language, our capitalistic system. Um, so that's the next step. Replace one symbol with another, subtly enough that the audience doesn't notice that any sort of trick has been played. It's like a game of three-card Monty. The emotions introduced in the beginning that have been attached to the concept of freedom are transplanted onto the newly equivocated concept of free enterprise. So when all is said and done, what America is, is everything you hold dear. And everything you hold dear is yours thanks to free enterprise now conflated with freedom. And what makes the propaganda effective is that the audience will feel like they are the ones arriving at that conclusion themselves. So um, this is the basic scheme of deliberately manipulative propaganda. And we're certainly immersed in that kind of propaganda, manipulative propaganda. Oh, everywhere. Um, they don't call it the post-truth age for nothing. Exactly. Well, but now that we've covered the shape of propaganda in its deliberately manipulative sense, let's recall again your broad definition with which we open the discussion. Propaganda is communication that exerts sociopolitical power intended to motivate behavior. What I want to ask is, does this mean that in your view, philosophy too is just another avatar of propaganda? Is philosophy its own form of exertion of socio-political power intended to motivate behavior? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the answer would be yes, given my broad definition of propaganda. Yes, it would be. Um, now, I don't want us to take this in the sense that philosophy is all just a meaningless power game, because propaganda isn't all just a meaningless power game either. Propaganda is the vehicle of ideology, and in my view, ideology is uh, the ideology into which we are embedded is the condition that makes meaningful engagement with life possible in the first place. Still, the work that we do in philosophy departments is ideological work, and the work that we do in these departments is furthermore guided according to ideological structures. Well, in, in terms of the work we do, we are very much in the business of setting up networks of axiomatically linked concepts. And this certainly fits with your description of ideology as consisting precisely of a network of axiomatic concepts. So we set up these networks, uh, we establish frames of meaning, we define and redefine terms, we propose and argue for or against interpretations. We do philosophical work of formulating questions, of raising certain questions and not others, of bringing to bear a certain theoretical framework or methodology for the exploration of a philosophical problem. These are all ways in which discursive boundaries are established within philosophy. And we shouldn't forget either that these activities are monitored and patrolled at the institutional level whether by university administrators, department standards, dissertation committees, the editorial boards of journals, market forces. Exactly. Um, 
So I'll, I'll put it this way, and this is what I'll say on the topic of market forces, et cetera. Um, all communication is ideological, philosophy included, because its coherency comes by virtue of its embeddedness within an ideological network. And these networks necessarily strive toward their own self-propagation. But an important part of what we do is critically call these networks into question. We do. And by calling them into question, we can create breaks within a particular ideological structure, opening the space for alternative interpretations to, um, to congeal and to fill in these newly created gaps. But again, the question remains, which structures shall we investigate? Where shall we choose to create breaks? What alternatives shall we supply to fill these breaks with? Our answers to these questions are themselves ideologically structured. Can we transcend all structure without losing all coherence? Um, I doubt it. Well, which raises the question of whether there can be such a thing as free philosophical thought, by which I mean thought that takes its point of departure from outside of the structures, outside of the institutions, that follows its own path of unfolding, its own timeline, its own logic, without being constantly neutralized by, say, for example, the scholarly protocols that define philosophy in the academic milieu. Well, is there any sort of thought which proceeds from outside of the institution, um, from outside of all institutions at all? Um, language itself is institutional, isn't it? So I'm not sure what a free thought, that is to say an entirely unideological thought, I'm not sure what that could be. And I'm skeptical that such a thought could ever be communicated coherently without undergoing in the process some sort of ideological reduction. Well, by free, I mean, of course, the free enterprise of thought that's uncontaminated by any isms, whether Nietzscheanism, Hegelianism, yeah. or what have you. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, why don't we just let the the free marketplace of ideas decide what's true? Well, that is essentially where we're at. <laughs> um, this all reminds me, though, um, of a point that, uh, well, I put it more succinctly in the paper. So I'll just read out the quote um, whom, whom I cite to save you from my um, scatterbrained ramblings. So this quote is from Stephen Holgate, uh, who is interpreting the philosopher Hegel on the question of freedom. Holgate writes, quote, um, What does it mean to be free? What determines the options among which I have to choose, if not my freedom itself? The only possibility is that those options are determined by factors other than my free will such as circumstance, chance, or nature, and that they are given to me to choose between or to reject. But if this is the case, then my freedom of choice is dependent on what is available to be chosen. Moreover, by insisting that freedom resides in being able to choose whatever I want, I limit myself to and make myself dependent on whatever I happen to want or wish for at the moment. That is, whatever my particular desires happen to be, or whatever my particular circumstances, or indeed the pressures of the market or of advertising, lead me to desire." End quote. Mm. So any so-called free thinker is always going to be bound by what came before, by what is legible or coherent in a given discourse. That's right, yes. For example, we're not allowed to come to Marquette's graduate program and just write whatever we want, defend it as free thought, and get to stick around. <laughs> no, it has to be recognized philosophy. 
And one of the purposes the academic institutions serve is to maintain standards for what counts as genuine philosophy. Standards, by the way, which I absolutely agree serve a critical function and which you and I, Bentley, are privileged to be submitting ourselves to as graduate students. Yes, um, standards certainly do serve a function. Um, but to what does that function serve? Um, I mean, this is all ultimately this tension as you bring up between free thought and the standards of the institution. Um, it seems to me that it ultimately boils down to the same tension between um, civilization and its, its many discontents. Um, if civilization is to maintain itself, well, it can only extend, legally speaking, it can only extend free speech as far as its own operational boundaries can allow. It must nevertheless subsist. And um, that is honestly pretty grim. Um, but for our one, um, I am a product of civilization and I wouldn't last very long without it. So it is what it is, I guess. Um, this does remind me, though, of an important point about uh, freedom of speech specifically, which the philosopher and um, actually the soon-to-be Nazi, Carl Schmitt, um, made in 1923. His point was that when you have a free press that is completely unregulated, it tends to lead parliamentary debates within liberal democracies towards a situation where, um, to quote Schmidt, Schmidt, quote, what representatives of the big capitalist interest groups agree to in the smallest committees becomes more important for the fate of millions of people than any political decision, such that openness and discussion become an empty and trivial formality, end quote. Um, in other words, the freer the speech, the more susceptible public discourse becomes to unremitted malicious propaganda. This is an excellent point, and it's also one that 20th century French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas makes, or he at least makes an analogous point. Uh, Levinas calls out liberalism's myth of freedom as what he describes the serene reason that chooses. Because liberalist freedom operates on the basis of a fraudulent theoretical separation between the sovereign individual on the one hand and the alleged wealth of possible destinies they are supposedly free to choose at any given moment on the other hand, ignoring that there are historical and material constraints at play in decision making. So a gap opens between these two, Levinas argues, and he warns that in this gap slips the lie, the special interests, the propagandists, the scam artists, the demagogues, and the fascists. Uh, he writes this in an essay titled The Philosophy of Hitlerism. So like what Schmidt also suggests, the more allegedly free speech is believed to be, the more susceptible it becomes to being co-opted by ideologues and propagated through the myth of a frictionless medium of individual sovereignty and choice that's manufactured under the name of freedom of the press. I think we could also take this back to the Hegel quote you shared uh, just a moment ago, which called into question the very concept of freedom when it comes to speaking or thinking. Here, Hegel seems to suggest that there are already predetermined grooves along which we think and speak. Grooves is the perfect word for it. Um, the fact is that there is no frictionless medium of individual sovereignty. And the propagation of this myth concretizes the grooves that it conceals. Um, all communication is mediated through a material form that depends on certain conditions to enable its possibility. So, I mean, you need to be alive in order to speak, and you need food to stay alive. And in the modern world, you need money to buy food. And even once you're in the position to speak, 
you need to have something to say and someone who will understand you when you say it. So on the first hand, communication is sociopolitical in that there are a whole lot of economic and political conditions that have to be met before it's possible for you to communicate. And then on the second hand, every act of speech also impels a force upon the discourse. And so is sociopolitical, not only in its conditions of possibility on the first hand, but in its effects as well on the second hand. The force we exert may be more or less micro or macro, and this usually depends on the size of the platform that you control. But um, no matter how small, all speech exerts sociopolitical force. Even when I ask you to hold the door open for me, what are you going to do? Say no? So even our voices right now are to some extent exerting some force in the world. But of course, nothing like the force that can be exerted by the big media corporations, for example. So impact can be amplified or diminished depending on the position you have in society and the kinds of resources you have available. And of course, also depending on what you have to say. Right. And when we talk about exertions of this power, we can think of it as, um, as a move made in a game where you have limited resources and you can only do so much at one time. So you have to decide, will I burn the amount of calories it takes for me to finish my sentence? Will I spend a billion dollars funding a political candidate that I want to win? These are both uh, exertions of sociopolitical power. If I decide to speak and say what I have to say, then that decision is a strategic one. In, it's strategic in the sense that I ha must have a reason to expect that my exertion will be worth my while. Otherwise, I simply won't speak. Of course, it's also the case, uh, you would agree, that the distribution of power is incredibly lopsided. Absolutely lopsided, yes. Um, and this lopsidedness calls again into question whether our so-called freedom of speech actually manifests itself within capitalism or whether it is not contradictory with that freedom of enterprise espoused by the cartoon. Is speech free when some have megaphones while others can only whisper? Yes, this is one of the questions we've been circling around in this discussion. But as a constitutional principle, freedom of speech is imperative to protect if we're finally to at least attempt to speak freely. And we have to try, right? And when we try, Bentley, what do we say? Well... It's a very difficult question. What exactly do we say when the time is right? I think that this is um, the work that philosophers have been busying themselves with for millennia. And the thing is that we almost never say all the way what we really mean to say or what we really want to say. Uh, and as soon as we've said it, its meaning is already out of our hands. So in light of this, um, what is worth saying? Well, if nothing is worth saying, because everything is ideological, then there's no meaning worth believing in at all, because all meaning is ideological. So should we just all be nihilists? Um, well, uh, I didn't myself much enjoy my own nihilistic phase, so I wouldn't want to spend my breath propagating nihilism. Um, I think that for life to be worth living at all, we do have to believe in some or another sort of myth. So what myth would you want to propagate then? Oh, um, well, I guess uh, health, <laughs> happiness, um, and flourishing uh, in a colorful world full of interesting experiences. And if that is a myth, then it's one worth believing in. So Bentleyism, you freely choose to follow <laughs> the, the myth of Bentley. <laughs> um, if my name ever becomes an ism, then I'll go back to being a nihilist.
You've been listening to Philosophy for the People, the only philosophy podcast bold enough to bring you the doctrines of Bentleyism. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs>If you enjoyed this discussion and would like to engage the topic in more depth, be sure to sign up for our free weekend seminar starting Saturday, September 5th. The seminar will be held online over a period of 14 weeks and is open to anyone. Just email philosophyforthepeople at gmail.com and you will be automatically registered to receive updates and weekly invitations to our online classroom. Again, that's starting September 5th. This has been a solid work production. Solid work. Solid work. Uh, solid work. Hey, solid, solid work. work.